Good morning, everyone. I'm Peter. Molly Haskell, as you know, is a distinguished cinema critic. And I should explain, maybe up front, that we come from different arenas. I am all about the business of film, and she writes about the art of film. As a result, I guess some of the directors you have admired, I have fired. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into that. Now, yeah. now I should explain. I always have a tough time when I read books about cinema. I, I find myself in a running argument with the writers as I read the book. The exception is Molly's book on Spielberg. I think it's a superbly written book. And I agree with your ideas and your perspectives. So number one, I congratulate you Thank on you. such an excellent piece of writing. But why did you write it? Well, that's interesting too. I don't know if you're familiar with the Yale University Press Jewish Live series. They're short biographies of obviously Jewish figures. They were funded by a guy named Leon Black. And there have been, I don't know, about 30 or 40. Um, one on um, Einstein, Freud, Sarah Bernhardt. Uh, David Thompson did the Warner Brothers. Right. And somebody's just come out with one on Ben Hecht. So they're short biographies ideally focusing on the Jewishness or the Jewish life of the figure. So I am an unlikely writer, not just because I'm not Jewish, and that never, f f as far as I was concerned, was not a problem because I really do believe that um, th that shouldn't be a bar. You can, anybody can write about anybody. I'm, I'm not into the appropriation thing. So that wasn't it. The main thing was um, they came to me and I thought, I was never a huge fan of Spielberg's, so that that stopped me because my I had sort of cut my teeth on European films and and male female love stories and all the ambiguities of relationships, and Spielberg was a fantasist and action all of the you know blockbuster a whole different kind of filmmaking, but then it seemed to me that that might be interesting because another fan writing about Spielberg would just be another fan writing about Spielberg. So also, it would give me a chance to sort of re-examine my own prejudices about Spielberg and the kind of films he was making. And it's short, and I, I, that appealed to me. Um, Peter asked me when we were emailing back and forth about this, about my not talking to him. I, in a way, I didn't really want to because I wanted to keep my distance. I was sure if I met him, I would think he was nice and I would be afraid to say anything negative. So, but he wouldn't do it. I got in touch with his henchman. They said he, he never gives interviews for biographies. So, and this was true. Joseph McBride, who did this sort of full dress biography of Spielberg about 10 years ago, he didn't get an audience with Spielberg either, but he talked to everybody else. So I could use his interviews with the school teachers and the father and the sisters. Um, the one person he didn't talk to because Spielberg tabooed it was Spielberg's mother. I think he was afraid of what she would say, so he didn't get to her. But he had all of that, so I had all this material. And then also, what appealed to me is that Spielberg said, my whole life is in my films. He started when he was 14 years old as a Boy Scout, and that's a whole other story about his... Um, and it, the Jewishness was interesting, too, because he grew up in assimilated communities. He was born in Cincinnati into a Jewish enclave. His, his, fa his grandfather was Orthodox. His parents were kind of semi-Orthodox, but they, his mother was a, a real pistol, a kind of artist in her own right, a concert pianist. And she very much wanted, they were assimilationists, as many of these post-war couples were. So they lived, they went, his father, Arnold, was a, a, a really a, computer genius in the early days. of He was an engineer in the early days of computers, so he had got a job in New Jersey. So Stephen grew up in these g Gentile communities. Meanwhile, the parents were observing. He was just completely confused and sort of alienated from his Jewishness. And then ev eventually, with Sh as he went along, and especially with Schindler's List, he began to come to terms with it. But I, so he said, my whole life is in my films. And so that, to me, I wanted to talk about the films. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm more critic than biographer. So I wanted to, t I could, I thought that sort of gave me license to tell his story through his films. So I really, that's what it is. It's sort mm -hmm. of a critical biography in a way. It is. The one interesting sidelight of Spielberg, contextually, is that he has probably made more money as an artist 
from any artist in the history of art. Uh, he is a man worth several billion dollars, and I think there's an attorney in this room who helped him gain that largesse. Mm -hmm. um, but I, your book is full of little surprises. One of them is, what is your, your favorite Spielberg well, my, f my favorites of his films uh, tend to be the, the least successful ones, <laughs> I right. mean, uh, which is sort of perverse. You know, the first feature-length film he made was Sugarland Express, a very interesting film, but very dark, and it was sort of a bit of a critical success, but not an audience success, and he just vowed he was never going to do that. He wanted to reach the largest audience. He always knew that. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to make art films. He didn't want to be an art house. He, did, he said, I'm not Orson Welles. I don't put my personal stamp on films, though that's a little bit questionable. I want to make the films for the largest number of people. And somehow he, he did that, and he did it over and over and over again. Um, I think he has an uncanny feeling for the zeitgeist. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But anyway, my favorite film, I think, of all is one called Empire of the Sun. I don't know if anybody's seen that. It's from, it was Christian Bale's first film role as this little boy. It's based on J.G. Ballard's stories about growing up in China during the war, horrific experiences. And this little boy who the Japanese are bombing Japan, uh, 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 China, and he's exhilarated. And this, this is what I think maybe one reason it wasn't, I mean, it's a, do, a little bit of a dark story, but also this little boy is so excited about war. And that's kind of... Mm -hmm. Something that's, that's sort of startling and maybe disconcerting to see this little kid who, like, and then he goes, of course, becomes feral. And it's a, it was uh, Tom Stopper did the screenplay, and I just think it's a magnificent film. I agree. By the way, one brief commercial: yeah. Jamie Cable and I run a war movie every month in the library here. Next in two weeks, we are running Empire of the Sun. Oh, so really? So anyone would like to see it? Oh. I have not seen it in what thirty years. Yeah. And it's an extraordinary movie, so we are showing oh, it in the library great. for that's free ah. with, with popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> now, why do you think that, that Stephen has worked so much, spent so much effort in his life to produce pictures rather than to direct them? What in him, being as such a, a superb director, why was he so intense on also being a mogul? Well, I'd like to ask, I, I'm dying to get some of your behind-the-scenes Hollywood <laughs> perspective on this, but I think, number one, he had what I think in the Yiddish term is spilkus. He, he was this anxious, anxious kid. He, he was afraid of everything when growing up. He was afraid of what the... the I mean, it, it, there, uh, there, these images all come out in his films, but the waving trees, he, he imagined them as go hobgoblins, and the, his parents were getting it. He was afraid all the time and anxious all the time, and he converted that into, his, you know, he, to making everybody else uh, terrified. I mean, he was able to, to, to create images in his films. But I think the other thing is he just had to work all the time. He just mm -hmm. had to. I think Kathleen um, Kennedy, his assistant, said at one point, this was right before Empire of the Sun, he's like somebody all the time who's had four cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it wasn't, I mean, for instance, when he was doing Schindler's List, he was in Krakow doing these dark scenes of these kids being taken away on trains to the concentration camp or hiding in the latrine, these dark, dark scenes. And meanwhile, he was on the uh, satellite to, to George Lucas's firm, Industrial Light and Magic, doing the editing on Jurassic Park. I mean, to imagine doing these two films yeah. at the same time. It's just unimaginable, and two such different films. But he needed yeah. that. So I, I think some of the, to answer your question about producing, a lot of the films he produced, especially early on, were, he wanted to be a G-rated artist. He did not want to do edgy, sophisticated, p potentially you know, R-rated. But he would do things like Who Killed Ro Roger Rabbit mm -hmm. and Back to the Future, and some of, which was really kind of risque. That whole Oedipal story is kind of wonderful. And he would produce films that, um, that he didn't want to direct. Mm -hmm. But then, I don't know, it, it, then this, it becomes more manic, and maybe you have some, because you would actually talk to him. He was on your show, and you talked to him, and mm -hmm. you told me that you had conversations about... Well, actually, I first met him 
uh, on being a native of Martha's Vineyard uh, on the set of Jaws. Oh, did you really? And he was directing. Were you there then? Spit. I was there. Oh, God, I'd love to hear about uh, I was there because I wanted to be. Yeah. And he was a totally tormented soul. As a young man, as you say, he is such a workaholic. He really hadn't prepared for that movie. And he was overwhelmed by the responsibilities and by the incompetence of his mechanical shark. <laughs> <laughs> He was going to use a real shark initially, but that didn't <laughs> yeah. work out. Somebody got yeah. wounded in Australia, and they said, we better go to a mechanical shark. And none of it worked. And he had two very able producers, Dick Sanek and David Brown. But he was, as I say, tormented because the cast and the crew were somewhat rebellious. Yeah. And it fascinated me that a young man that bright and that am ambitious did not really do his homework at that moment in time. Mm. And as you can see, later in life, he did, he did uh, his How homework. Was right. Well, he went over budget, I think, the seven times over budget, yeah, uh, yeah. which is an all-time record for a young director um, well, shooting. Th this was his first big picture. He'd yes. done Sugar Land Express, and they had this bestseller. Peter Benchley's book was a bestseller. And you would have thought, it was almost like Gone with the Wind, where mm -hmm. you, you were sort of t worried about people loving the book and not liking the movie. And to give it to this neophyte, was a huge gamble on their part. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And, and nobody thought, had any idea it was going to pay off the way it did, did they? They just thought... That was a great film, though. Did you, oh, yeah. did you review it well? Uh, well, um, no. Because most way, critics did not review no, it. No, well. because... And this is something I think we may talk a little bit about in our next thing, about the evolution of film and film criticism at this certain period in time. It came out in 1974. The late 60s and early 70s were a fantastic time from movies and cinephile, all of that. And there were these very sophisticated kind of movies being made by Altman and even Coppola, you know a lot about that. And all of a sudden, here was this shark movie and it was being marketed, uh, the whole change in marketing. All of a sudden mm -hmm. it was um, the, the summer blockbuster. And, and then shortly thereafter came Star Wars and, and sort of, science fiction were being uh, being raised to kind of a movie status and it, and they were, it seemed to us driving out what we consider the sort of good really interesting european style films mm -hmm. that hollywood was making for a while and that you admired but he didn't quite get i mean no. he did not quite get the, the Euro and it, it was interesting because so many of his confreres the coppolas and so forth were motivated to be filmmakers because of what was happening in Europe. And Stephen was an exception. He didn't quite get it. I was fascinated because he obviously on some s level was influenced by the great directors of Europe, don't you think? I think so. But I mean, he, his, his avowed uh, d uh, goal in life was to be a Hollywood director, always. Mm -hmm. And his first job was a kind of something at Universal Studios where they let him sit in the editing room. But he started, all these people were making personal films, Scorsese and his contemporaries, De Palma. He started in television, which in a way was good experience for him. I mm -hmm. think it was a good training ground. But always it was the industry. I mean, mm -hmm. he wanted to be an old-fashioned mogul and director mogul, I think. Well, I was interested in your comments in the book about his growth as a director. For example, because he was so famous and so wealthy, as a result of his action films. Talk a bit about th that period when he wanted to do more social conscious cinema, particularly his pictures about African Americans. Yeah. How do you feel about those, that period of his life? Well, I, th I think it's interesting. Yeah, he decided, he, he really did swerve into kind of serious human, from fantasy and adventure into humanist kind of serious movies and also doing adventure because he would do the Indiana Jones. But yeah, he did Amistad and The Color Purple, and they both got critically panned, but I think they stand up pretty well. I mean, the two actresses, um, um, uh, Oprah Winfrey in her first movie mm -hmm. role and, and his feeling for them, I think, I think that, that movie really stands up well. And I, I guess at this point, he wanted to be taken seriously, and people were saying all he can do is fantasy, and he wanted to be taken seriously. So I think that was... Do you think he was panned unfairly? In other words, what, are we revisiting that sort of criticism today where basically a, a, a white director is in danger if he tackles uh, yes. uh, an African-American theme? Yes. 
Who is he to do that? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was. But you know, I think this is a brave thing about him. He's done things like that, and I think Schindler's List could have gone so wrong. And that, that's such a treacherous subject to make a film out of, and he made it, and, and I think he did an admirable job. And so th I think this is a serious part of him that did work out. No, mm -hmm. but I think it's true that he was he was paying for appro appropriating up material that didn't really belong to so him. So do you feel he has grown as a director, that there's real growth in his work over the years? Because his films in the last few years have been sort of idiosyncratic in mm. their subject matter. And whether it's AI or even the the video game movie, yeah, which you liked a bit. R AI, Ready. I liked. I haven't seen the new, the video player Ready one, whatever player that is. One, yeah. I don't even know what it is. I see. <laughs> but I thought AI was fantastic. That's a very dark film. I think largely because Kubrick was really the one who was going to originally do it and did the script, and Spielberg didn't soften it. I mean, I think people have accused him of sentimentality, but if you look at that film, this little boy. It's a Pinocchio story of this little robot who want, who's wants desperately to be human so his mother will love him, and the mother abandons him. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. It's a heartbreaking movie and very dark and interesting, I think, and very much, again, he's just sort of on top of the zeitgeist again with the artificial intelligence. Minority Report, which I think is also very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the Philip K. Dick, he was doing that before 9-11, and then 9-11 happened right in the middle of it. And there was, because it's all about surveillance, and then Bush came in and started the Patriot Act with Ashcroft. And the, I mean, it was just so much of the, mo un uncannily and unbelievably mm -hmm. of the moment. Now, in, in your book, you, you talk um, uh, very interestingly about uh, the fact that as a young Jewish nerd, he had difficulty dealing with the interaction of men and women. Yeah. Now, talk a bit about the films where he has tried to deal with, uh, with <laughs> that subject. Well, yeah, he, he's wisely stayed away from it, I think, for the most part. Um, he really has, the, I mean, the, you can't think of any really great women roles. He has, he grew up with these three sisters and who, who he tortured constantly. And but um, and this wild, wild, crazy mother, and so I think his vision is formed somehow by those. And a lot of the women, like Karen Allen in the in the Indiana Jones movies, is very much a kind of tomboy sister-like figure. And um, Holly Hunter in what's it? Always is that the no? Yeah, yeah, uh, and always. always. <laughs> yeah. Um, just again, a sort of tomboy-like figure, and she gets dressed in a wedding dress, and she looks like she's in her mother's dress-up clothes. And that was one that was based on a very romantic movie. And mm -hmm. I think, I, to me, my thinking, it just doesn't come off at so all. So his worst failures were his efforts at romance. Yeah, yeah. But he's great with Meryl Streep in the post, so he can, he can do women. It's just men and women that he can't do in a way. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did you feel about? my favorite Spielberg picture, which was E.T. Oh, and it's yeah. the only picture I've ever taken my mother to, because my mother didn't particularly like movies. Uh -huh. And I said, I'd like you to see this, because there's some interesting subtext in this picture. And of course, she, she went crazy at it. But you had some interesting comments about the subtext of E.T. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Oh, I can't remember <laughs> what I said, but um, um, well, well, the whole little the little boy was to a degree him. Yes. And to a degree, again, he was a little Jewish well, kid who was alienated. He was alienated, and he was he became fascinated with the skies, with science fiction. One night, his father took him, and this is the kind of this comes out in Close Encounters. His father had read there was going to be a comet landing, so he got him in the car and stuck coffee and. Spielberg didn't know, he didn't really have a great relationship with his father. And he thought, what is he doing? Is he kidnapping me? Because the parents were at each other. So then he, they went into this incredible expanse in Arizona. Arizona. After he left New Jersey, they lived in Arizona. And that really, as you can see in so many of the films, that landscape was hugely important to him. But so they sat there, and it, the media didn't arrive, but there was a, 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 a start, what is it, a shower? Um, it wasn't a meteor. It was a kind of a shower of mm -hmm. heavenly whatever. And his father was was, was sort of upset in, in a little 
almost afraid of it. It wasn't what he'd expected, but Spielberg loved it. He was in awe, and this quality of awe, and even a, I think there's a, a tremendous spiritual quality in him. Mm -hmm. And I even thought, in a way, when he was living in New Jersey and all the kids, he was surrounded by Protestants and Catholics, and they were celebrating Christmas, and he wanted so much to have a Christmas tree, and he couldn't, and he was sort of mortified when his religious grandfather would come and, and behave oddly and he, you know, you so want the kids to like you. And at one point he rigged up something that was like a Christmas tree and he would do the, did a little light show. So I think something in it that's religious and it's, it's really ecumenical in a way, but there's this religious awe in E.T. and especially Close Encounters of the Third Kind and in other films that I think I came to appreciate more when I, I mean, when they came out, he had this funny interview that I was r researching where it was like 1978 and he was at the American Film Institute teaching a master class of kids who wanted to be directors. And he'd had these two huge successes, uh, Jaws and um, E.T. And they were all kind of suspicious of this guy who'd made all this money. I mean, there he was in his baseball cap and he looked about 18 years old. And they thought, what are you going to do now? And so he was saying, well, you just have to have confidence in what you're doing. You can't worry if critics like Andrew Saris and Molly Haskell don't like your movie. So, <laughs> so I thought maybe that was one reason he didn't want to see it. I don't, I don't really think it was. But we felt this was something new, and it really was something new. Mm -hmm. The whole, as I say, the elevation of science fiction to a movie status and ch the child or, you know, the because all of a sudden, this is the other thing that happened, it was kids going to movies and going, mm -hmm. the repeater audience. So the whole audience, the demographic was changing in favor of young, young, young. And the other thing that I think Spielberg started, and I was, there was these, these guys, I forget their name, Duffer, I think, that did this series called Strange Things, and very much influenced, it was recently, but it was based in the 80s, and it's very much influenced by Spielberg. And they were saying, we just want to hold on to the things we loved as children. So this, mm -hmm. to me, was the mentality. I want to go back to, instead of sort of growing out of your childhood fantasies, you cling to them, that you treasure them. And hmm. we, I, I just wasn't on board with that. And most critics weren't. And then they came around. I was looking at some of the reviews of uh, Star Wars, too. The, mm -hmm. the, there, was not, there was a lot of resistance among critics to Star Wars. And then everybody kind of caves or whatever, I don't know. They came to appreciate yeah. the, you know, the craft and, and, I, and, and it was families too, I think. It was having a movie that the family could, you could take your children to, that kind That's of right. thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw Close Encounters was recut and so I saw it just several weeks ago and um, it's a fascinating film. Again, it's it very Spielbergian very, and it's yeah. all about his imagination. Again, the quarreling husband and wife didn't work. Yeah. And he, the creatures at the end of Close Encounters weren't quite right. No, I know. And, and I think that uh, it's interesting that he loved that picture and it, it inspired so many other uh, people. He was very close friends at that time with uh, Julia Phillips. Yeah. And they, um, they uh, you describe the, the famous house in Malibu where a lot of the young Hanging out, wannabe yeah. filmmakers uh, <laughs> would go there and uh, communicate. And the interesting guest was I was a very occasional guest. Did you? Was who was going to make it big time yeah. and who was not? Uh, but there was uh, Julia Phillips was presiding over it, and I remember one of the problems I had with uh, my writings uh, was um, when um, uh, Julia came in when I was at Paramount and pitched a very expensive and complicated science fiction picture. And it was an excellent script. And I was, I was delighted that she, as a woman, uh, was really making gains as a producer. Yeah. So I said, Julia, there's only one thing about you that I must ask you, a personal question. The left half of your hair on your head is burnt off. Do you freebase? <laughs> and she said, well, actually, I do. And I said, now, what in the world would make you think that as a boring studio executive, I want to give you the responsibility for producing a very expensive science fiction picture? And she looked at me and she said, I don't think you trust women. 
Now, later in her book, You'll Never Have Lunch in This yeah, Town Again, she again accused me of being against women. Oh. And I was only against freebasing women. <laughs> Well, which everybody was doing except Spielberg in those parties, right? Everybody yes. was on something except him. He was absolutely clear he wasn't going to do drugs. I mean, he was just so focused at such an early age. He never went through that phase. Right. But in a way, the, well, I think one of the, the things that came out of that Julia Phillips interview was that the movie would be like a, a trip. And it was, but it was certainly no sure thing. I mean, that was these kinds of movies weren't being made then. Mm -hmm. And so it was a huge risk. Now... Do you think that part of the reason Stephen sustained himself so superbly over the years mm. was because he did take all of these excess energies, start DreamWorks, which you describe, interesting, because DreamWorks was an extraordinary innovation. Yeah. You know, the Sp Spielberg, Geffen, Geffen. and uh, <laughs> Spielberg, Geffen, and give us the... <laughs> K Katzenberg. And Jeffries. Yeah. He, see, not easy to forget. Yeah. So they have Thank raised you. billions of dollars to start this extraordinary company yeah. that was not just going to produce movies, but it was going to have an sound stages and a whole different idea about how, how movies should be shot. Mm. And DreamWorks f never really succeeded as a company. And I wonder if a lot of his creative energies were compromised and drowned almost in, in that effort. How, how do you read that? Well, I think you probably can tell better than I can, but I think he wasn't, it wasn't good for him because at that point, he, he had to be a head of a studio, and that, I mean, he, yes, he wanted to be that, but it really wasn't where his heart was and where his talent was. Mm -hmm. And um, it just didn't, it, you know, it didn't work out. They made a couple of good films and then mostly not very good films, and it was like nobody was minding the store somehow because each one, these were very independent-minded people, although they did work with other people well. I don't know, I just... What was the sort of feeling in Hollywood about it as it sort of... Well, I think, I think Hollywood, his confreres, admired him for wanting to... Yeah, to, the ambition to, of... To reinvent the film business. Because yeah. the movie business was <coughs> going through one of its periodic downturns. Yeah. So that energy and that creative zeal was very welcomed. Yeah. Uh, but the feeling always was that that, that, that threesome was unlikely. And the idea of actually building a whole new physical studio yeah. was, I mean, one thing that he pointed out that I thought was interesting is, you know, I'm a director. Directors, if you are about to start a scene, you like to take your actors into another room and rehearse. There's no room for that on a soundstage. Yeah. And it's true, the old Hollywood moguls, they never were interested in rehearsals and never mm -hmm. had a, a, a place, place for that. For uh -huh. But Stephen was, again, a serious director, yeah. and he wanted to talk to his... Uh -huh. actors. And again, his performances that he elicited from his actors were brilliant, I thought. Yeah, I don't think he's gotten enough credit. That's another thing I think I came to really appreciate more is what great, he, f he sees people early on. I mean, a lot of the people, and he's did, he did five movies with Tom Hanks, all of which are, even um, the one, the airport one, Terminal. Terminal, right. Um, it's one of the lesser movies, but still, Hanks is great in it. Um, he, he has in, in, I think The Post has a fantastic group of subsidiary actors. He's mm -hmm. just great at... Ca I think he's gotten better and better at that as he's gone along. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the um, semi-production -produ function. But You know, the, the one of his strengths and weaknesses was script. And yeah. he worked very assiduously on his screenplays. But there were certain Spielbergian cliches that he would fall into the good guys versus the bad yeah. guys. Everything had to be pretty structured. And clear. He wanted clarity. I and mean, I think mm -hmm. I think some of the best movies are kind of murky and ambiguous. He didn't want anything like that. <laughs> right. And I think he all, the other big failing I think he has is he just can't trust the audience. He has to hammer home the ending, mm -hmm. uh, often uh, going beyond when it's like Lincoln, I think, was a, there's a perfect ending when he sort of walks out the door, but he has to go on and on and just sort of underline it and make sure you've, you've got it, got the picture. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much, it's interest today that the critic's favorite movie is Roma, which doesn't bother with a third act at all. Yeah, I think yeah. Stephen would not have been happy. No, no, he wanted, the, yeah, structure, would, absolutely. He wanted, he wanted, also he I said, I always want my movies to arrive someplace. Right. 
So it was classical, what he saw of his classical storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, now, on the post, however, I always thought that the prob one problem with the post, what there was sort of the wrong hero, that there, it was a new... I, I started on the New York Times, and you've written a lot for the New York Times. Yeah, they it was really the young publisher of the New York Times who really was willing to publish that, and he would have lost everything. Yeah. Whereas Catherine Graham had a lot of safeguards. Yeah. So I always thought there was a wrong hero in that movie. Oh, a, a lot of people felt that way, and people wrote about it. And the Times was fairly gracious about not making a big deal of it, but I, absolutely yeah. they, were, they were there first. Another interesting thing, this is like, you know, it's interesting to talk about movies that are based on a real story, which more and more movies claim to be now. And, um, of course, it's about one-tenth the real story. But here, uh, Catherine Graham emerges, and I think justifiably, as a hero, um, uh, she pulls this whole thing off. And But there's a scene where she's coming out of the Supreme Court and all these women are clapping. A friend of mine, Mary Willis, was working at Newsweek at the time, and the Newsweek women all wanted were protesting for equal pay, for you know, more equality, and Catherine Graham absolutely sided with management and didn't and denied it to them. Mm -hmm. And Mary wrote about this. This was all sort of the in the Harvey Weinstein fallout era. Uh, well, I guess that's still happening. So um, that she was writing for More magazine at this point and wanted to speak to Catherine Graham about why they had not. Um, they had signed this contract, and they had a, a agreed to do better by women, and they really hadn't lived up to it. So Catherine Graham invited her to come for an interview at the, um, the UN Plaza, that fancy apartment building on the East River. And Mary went up there, and Catherine said, well, Ms. Graham, um, pardon me, but I have to get ready for a party. Do you mind? So Mary had to go in the bedroom while Catherine Graham went and sort of t took her shower and came in in her bathrobe, and it was this, this humiliating thing for her. I mean, she said uh, sexual, um, and it's, you know, call it sexual abuse, but mm -hmm. abuse of one kind or another isn't restricted to the kind of Harvey Weinstein thing because she put her on the spot. She, she was sort of saying, we're all girls together. You can't, mm -hmm. and, and Mary felt she couldn't write negatively about her after she'd been taken into this intimacy with her. So it was a really, she wrote about it lately. After this, after the film came out, and she said Catherine Graham deserves all the plaudits yeah. she got, but there was this other side to her yeah. so that cause Steven Spielberg would never be interested in that for, for sure. So let me ask you an, an unfair question about him. I and mean, one, one of the strange uh, dis people who run studios have a distorted relationship with filmmakers, because people like me are all about fear and anger and they're gonna, you're going to cut my budget or change my ending or give you a shitty opening date. But nonetheless, out of that fear and paranoia, you can have some interesting dialogues with filmmakers, mm. knowing that it's predicated on that. Yeah. Now, it's a long-winded way of saying, asking you this. Had you been a friend of Spielberg's over the years as his career and personal life changed, what sort of guidance and advice would do you think you would have given to him as a friend and as well as a critic? I don't think there's anything I could have said to him that would have been useful to him given his mindset. I mean, it would have been fun. Um, I did get a, a lovely little thank you note uh, for the book. Um, he said he'd just gotten around. He'd been made two, two films last year, so he'd just gotten around to reading it, and he said some nice things. And he said it would be fun to talk about film sometime or something, and I wrote back and said it would. And I think it would. Um, his trouble with his wives was he, well, I thought one, the, one of the interesting things was Amy Irving was the first wife, mm -hmm. and she, such a beautiful woman and great, a, terrific actress, but she got caught up in this thing where he, he didn't want, she didn't want to appear in his films because it would be nepotism. Other directors didn't want to hire her because he would be looking over their shoulders, so it sort of more or less put her career uh, in the tank. Mm -hmm. So that, And also, he spent his whole time, he had a screening room, and all he wanted to do <coughs> was look at movies. He said, I'd rather be doing this than be sitting on the Riviera someplace. Yeah. So, I mean, Amy Irving had a sort of, wa sort of broader cultural um, sensibility, mm -hmm. and that didn't work out. But the, I think Kate Capshaw has pr proved to be a perfect wife for him in some ways. I mean, she's the one who converted to Judaism, mm -hmm. and I think it was... She, uh, she said, 
he he was um, auditioning her for her role, what would become her role in Indiana in the second or third Indiana Jones movie, and she just said she had set her cap for him before mm -hmm. she even met him, and then she loved his films, and so at that point he was still sort of tied up with Amy, but he kept her in mind and she kept him is in mind, and she converted to, to Judaism. And I don't think it was a calculation uh, for uh, to, to capture him, but it did somehow help bring him in both into the in, back into the faith and back to in a reconciliation with the father somehow she's somehow proved the perfect wife and i don't know i don't envision him ever doing a great love story of any kind mm -hmm. but i think um she's maybe i don't know broadened him i mean they spent a lot of time doing philanthropic stuff too that's another huge part of his life that and setting up that um USC Shoah Foundation, all that. So, I mean, he's done these amazing things. It's amazing that he can keep making movies in addition to doing all this it other is. stuff. It is, and f friends of his have commented to me that they're always worried about the fact that he does, at this point of his life, have a great sense of his own wealth and yeah. power yeah. and his own responsibility. Mm. And the trouble is, as you choose what films to focus on, mm. If you are also, in addition, rather than just saying, I want to tell a good story, yeah. if you also have to go through this business of saying, well, what is it socially responsible for someone with $8 billion mm. to do? How, how should I reflect that sense of responsibility? Well, I think that's one reason he sort of had a sort of um, a dual thing of doing serious films on the one hand and sort of playful adventure stories on the other mm -hmm. because that he could fulfill what he <coughs> now saw as his <coughs> sort of humanistic and humanitarian um, consciousness on the one hand and then p just play mm -hmm. on the other. Well, one thing that I admired in him as well is that he wanted to mentor young filmmakers. Yes, he did a lot of that. And yeah. he really wanted to be constructive and helpful. Mm -hmm. And I uh, now and then, when I was at MGM, uh, for example, I would call him and say, so I'm thinking of hiring this young director. Mm. You've worked with him. Tell me, give me some advice. And he'd always freeze and say, well, you've got to understand, I would never say anything critical of a young director I'm working with. Mm. So I said, understood. So I said, therefore, if I mention a name, why don't you just be quiet? Mm. And he'd say, well, okay. So I'd run a name by him there'd be silence. Oh. <laughs> and I'd run another name saying, you know, he's a really bright young man. There's great promise there. Yeah. Uh -huh. But his unwillingness ever to render Bad criticism yeah. struck me yeah. as I sort of respected that. Yeah. But it also was troubling when it was someone like me who was looking for research. Well, I think he was very conscious of his own image, you know, and he would apparently even smoke a little on the side. He even was a part of a gun group for a while. But that doesn't appear in his official biography. He was absolutely determined to keep this facade always of the sort of upstanding PG good guy. You know, I know we're not supposed to open for questions, but we can if we want to. If we repeat the question, I'd love to. We have a, a, about five minutes. Does anybody want to come in on this? No one will repeat yes, them over badly. Here. Could you see any of his movies go on stage? That's an interesting thing because, you know, that's only in the last like 20 years that that's happened. It always, of course, was staged to the opposite way. Um, hmm. The smaller. Uh, well, they depend so much on special effects. I think well, the ones I'm. The, well, the I don't know the post. I think the post could be theater. Post, yeah, it that is be. the closest. To it's theater. the closest. Yeah. I, I think films like Always would not have worked in theater either. Yeah. But now you know he is next project doing West Side Story. So the reverse is taking place as with Color Purple. Yeah. So he wants to recreate West Side Story, right, as a film, which once again is very courageous endeavor because, because it was I'd be scared to death to be make compared. a film. I know. Yeah, to, to, to do to, that again. To, to invite comparison to that. And also I think the sense of wonder in, in most of the films is something you can't capture on the stage. Um, I mean, I think it's like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which, which sort of is a, contains that memory of his, with his father out there looking at the stars that night, is, I mean, and that's a, a kind of a bleak. He says, he said recently that he, he 
having become a father, he would never have the father leave the family if he were making that film today. But to me, that's what's so powerful about it, in a way, the fact that he absolutely just walks out. And I think it, it was Spielberg's feelings about both his father as absent and his own con confusion and ambivalence about having a relationship or following his vocation as, as, a, as being in conflict. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Does anyone yeah. else want to ask? Well, I know it's... Oh, wait, back here. Uh, with, with all of his anxieties, do, do I think he is a happy? I don't think he can ever be, I don't think he wants to be happy that way, <laughs> the way we think of it. I mean, he feeds on this anxiety. He needs it. I think that's one of the reasons he's doing too many things. It's, yeah. It sort of fuels, uh, somehow it fuels him. And he's even said that when he did um, the, the Indiana Jones movies, he, he learned a lot of craft. He, he's practicing his craft. So I think that that incredible busyness is just... That, that angst, is, it, that that's who he is, yeah. There is no other filmmaker I really, that I can think of offhand, maybe a little bit Francis Coppola, who wanted, while finishing a picture, actually to be responsible for editing or yeah. supervising another film. Yeah. And, and Coppola admitted that he was a prisoner of his own megalomania, yeah. whereas I don't think that, and he also admitted that he's a really shitty businessman. Uh -huh. I mean, Francis Coppola has finally emerged as a, a very successful person because of wine and cheese. Uh -huh. But his movie, as a businessman, his movie endeavors were a disaster. Yeah. And again, maybe that's true of Stephen. Maybe that sensibility of being a filmmaker should induce you to just stay being a filmmaker. And, do, and, and doing everything. I mean, one of the things he did when he was a boy and he had his first movie camera, his father would take the, just the, the typical home movies of everybody going on a picnic. Well, Stephen would stage them. He would say, no, you have to get into the car a certain way, and then he'd have them do it again and do it from a different <laughs> angle. So, so, I mean, he, he was in editing already. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd started editing when he was 14 years old. So um, mm -hmm. it's, 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 a it's such a phenomenon, it's almost hard to, to grasp, I think. It's just so beyond anything I've ever seen. And yeah. I mean, Orson Welles was a piker compared to Spielberg. I mean, he was maybe he was a greater right. filmmaker in some ways, but... Certainly the most irresponsible one. Did you have yeah. a question? <laughs> yeah, I, I wondered about the film Munich, because it, it yeah. seems like, um, you know, often sentiment creeps into Spielberg's movies, and, um, but that movie seemed um, a little bit different to me, and it felt very disciplined in the way that... Some Munich and being more disciplined. Well, Tony Kushner did a terrific screenplay, for one thing, I think. And, I mean, some critics did criticize it, but because it balanced Mossad with the Palestinians and all that. But I think it's, a, I think it's one of his, his very good movies. And it is somehow more adult, I think, in some yeah. ways. Me yeah, yeah, more ambiguous, more European, in a way. That's yeah. right. Well, um, we should break for lunch. I just want to, again, congratulate you for writing such a terrific thank book you. about thank a you difficult subject. Thank you all for coming. It was great. Thank you.